Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm talking with Russ Perry, and he is known as the Sober Entrepreneur. And we're going to be talking about how he made the worst hiring mistake he ever made made in his business and that led to drinking drugs and affair the total pit of his entire life to date but it also led to where he is now where he is able to connect with his business intuition and he has made some incredible business decisions that have let him grow his business design pickle from zero to six million dollars in annual recurring revenue in just three years and perhaps more importantly it's made it an amazing culture and team um so also we'll look at how he made some other mistakes when he wasn't using his intuition, uh, managed to learn, lose $200,000 in his first business and maybe had some other issues there. And we'll also talk about how you listening may be addicted to a bad business model and aren't prepared to give up <laughs> business model and what you can do about that. So uh, welcome Russ. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Good, uh, good evening or morning, depending on where, where everyone's at. Yeah, morning for you in Arizona, evening <laughs> for me in, in uh, I was going to say sunny Thailand, but right now it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I just want to start with this most, I know you probably don't really want to talk about this, but we're going to ask you to talk about it. The worst hiring mistake you ever made where you weren't using your intuition perhaps. Yeah. So talking about it actually isn't a problem now. Uh, I wrote a book about it, which I'm sure we'll mention later on, but I think the worst hiring decision, um, well, it really was a period of time when which I was doing everything but ignoring my business intuition. Uh, the, the general answer, and I'll get into specifics, that's where the juicy details are, is that I was a man who was always looking for an answer in somebody else. And I let, I let that guide a lot of my hiring decisions for many years. I was always looking to find the experts and find the person that had the right answers to help solve my problems. Uh, what ended up happening out of that was I found and I brought in people who um, most of which weren't necessarily like bad people, but they were... We were, we were setting everyone up for failure because I had such high expectations on them to perform and to succeed that, that it, was, it was an impossible game to win. And so then I would mm -hmm. get frustrated. Um, I would be resentful. And at the time, I lacked the leadership and communication skills to do the unthinkable and actually talk to them directly about their problems, which... Oh. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh my gosh, it's like a revelation nowadays. Um, and so th this ultimately led to, to one person in particular that um, it was a, a very destructive uh, path that I went down. Uh, I was heavily involved in alcohol. I, was, I, I am an alcoholic. I've been sober for four years now. But the High five. All right. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you mix alcohol, you mix drugs, you mix isolation and stress and depression and uh, one person in particular that I worked with ended up, we had an affair and it was mm -hmm. um, the, the mistake of my life, the, the pit that I will never be any lower than at that point. But it was ultimately a huge wake up call for me on like about 10 different levels on how I needed to change and what needed to change in my life so that I literally could live because I was, I was mm -hmm. most certainly on a path that would have resulted in my death, whether it was immediately or at the age of 50 be of a heart attack because of, of unhealthy habits and a lifestyle over a few decades. Do you know any entrepreneurs who've done that? They, they've done that hard living, drinking, affairs, drugs, overworking, and then they did croak of a heart attack? You, you know, thankfully, I don't know many. Uh, I've had two family members die of heart related issues who were very much involved in addictive habits, uh, alcohol, drinking. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know, I, you know, one was sort of an entrepreneur family business, but I can tell you this is I have, I, the, my eye is on a lot of guys and gals here in the mm -hmm. circles that I've seen that you're just, you know, it's not sustainable and the body will degrade really fast at a certain point. 
And mm. so I will not be surprised when it starts happening because some of my um, people I've, I've met in their 50s, um, 60s, they look like they're 80. And it's one of those things mm. where any moment, you know, something could just break or shut down. Right. And I, I'm kind of wondering in retrospect, why, why do you think you, you had this addiction to alcohol? What? It, you know, it's, that's like a really good question. I've actually never been asked that question before. My belief is it is, it is two parts. One is very biomechanical. I think there is a, um, you know, in the brain with any type of substance or reward, you get that dopamine release. You get that, that, that hit of feel good chemicals. And for some people that doesn't, you, you don't require a lot. So just going outside on a walk, you're able to enjoy it and it's a rush and you feel fantastic. Um, for others, you actually have almost the resistance in the sense that you require a, a high level of, of activity and, and alcohol and drugs. Um, many of them are a bio, like a biomechanical like release for those feel good drugs. The problem is, is that they have mm. a huge, huge downside to it. So I think I'm bio, I'm like wired to just like crave mm. that more. And so that's what leads to those addictive personalities but I also know that this, mm. and this is the second part of the book, is like, as an entrepreneur, we are stacking the deck against us in so many ways, including creating a lifestyle that can be highly stressful. And I simply lacked basic stress management 101. And so my stress management strategy was stress, suppress, stress, suppress. And that's what the alcohol did for me is it pushed down whatever was I was struggling with. But then when I was able to um, finally break free from that and learn healthy living habits that didn't involve substances, I was able to really manage my stress. And, and, and the, the, the biomechanical side of it wasn't even a factor because I wasn't even attracted to the substances. Mm. That's great because, you know, I, I know people who, I used to drink myself. I gave it up about nine years ago. All right. It just got in the way of me. Yeah. It, but my, I mean, I, in retrospect, I, I think I did have some alcoholism, you know, because I go out every weekend and get drunk and I drink every day, which, you know, sounds pretty alcoholic to me. <laughs> but, um, at the time I didn't think, I thought it was just normal, you know, well, I thought, and it, oh, you know, like, don't you we just party? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and you know, you hear, hard, stories. Hard. <laughs> you, you hear stories of like, well, my grandma still drinks a cup of whiskey every day and she's 89 and works fine. So yeah, I think everyone's wired differently, but what you said to me, that's the big, how thing. much is your grandma's annual recurring revenue? Russ, you know? <laughs> Zero, it's $200 yeah. a month, social security. Right. <laughs> so she may have slightly less stress in her life. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, for me, I wanted to get in touch with my spiritual side. And I found when I drank, I just disconnected from that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm kind of curious whether you had any, you know, do you think in retrospect, you were taking these things so you didn't have to connect with your intuition? Or Yeah, well, in my, my spiritual journey was muted ever since I introduced alcohol into my life as a high school aged student, I stopped mm. growing spiritually. I stopped listening to my intuition or the voice or God or whatever interpretation that people have for that. And, and I always share when I eliminated alcohol, I literally felt like alcohol like took up this part of my life. And this, I feel like this physical guy, this can, Container, this physical container that that when you drink it it consumes you and it's not just the drinking and being drunk and going out it's all the rituals around it it's meeting at the bar it's buying something it's um the next day it's like that the, the and for me like here in the united states like you know you drinking and driving is a huge problem and so 
who's going to get home, who's going to drive it. I might have one drink, then I got to not have a drink. So this cognitive bandwidth is just consumed on this topic. And so when I removed that from my life and I removed alcohol, I had this huge cavity inside of me that was then a, I was able to fill with spirituality and with connection. And for the first time ever, um, that was when I felt like I had finally gotten con contact with the voice. Like I finally heard myself for the first time. And, um, and that was epic. I mean, that was like when I started to really question life and think about things at a deeper level. Oh, we lost yes. you. I, we, I think we were speaking far too much truth for the internet to be able to <laughs> Well, but, um, you were saying drinking and driving. And, um, oh, yeah. So I was just saying like the, the, you know, drinking and driving here in the States, at least it's like a huge um, danger. So, so all the rituals, to sum it up, like all the rituals around drinking takes up like mental bandwidth. And I, like I said, I imagine this container was filled with all of the decisions and the cause and effects and all of these things. And so when I eliminated that from my life, it was like, ah, like a sigh. And I had this vacancy and that's when the voice and my intuition finally was like, well, it's about time I can now speak and, and like you could hear me. And uh, yeah, so that was when I started to really ask deeper questions and be re -pro like, you know, put on the new trajectory, not guided by external things, but guided by the internal. Yeah, because part of the drinking is, is an external, there's a lot of advertising around drinking and there's a lot of peer pressure and, you know, let's go out drinking. Mm -hmm. And it is almost, it, it is a, to, you know, I want to get that experience of feeling high and feeling connection with others. And I'm doing it through alcohol instead of through real connection. Or and that tends to be the number one reason why people are afraid to drink or sorry, afraid to quit drinking is they have social pressures they are worried about. Well, what about my friends? Well, I just love, I'm the fun guy. What am I going to do on New Year's? My mm -hmm. significant other drinks or I get uncomfortable in public situations. So how am I like, you know, that loosens me up. Every reason why someone wants to drink is always an external reason, period. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Or wants to continue to drink. There are a few people who are like, I, yeah, I just like, you know, I just like chilling out. But you could get that same effect through other things like meditation, exercise. Um, and so when you, when you present that case, they're like, then there are all the external reasons that, that come to play. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to Anna Wickham on the podcast and, and she gave up drinking, I think maybe a year ago and it just totally changed her business and she's so much happier from being yeah. on that. So, um, it's interesting because it, it's a depressant, I think, right? I mean, it is. I mean, and that's that biochemical, um, it's, there's the reaction of the dopamine drop, but what happens is because that's artificially triggered, you end up with the deficits and you end up with a, uh, uh, this biochemical reaction over the next 24 to 72 hours in which you are clinically depressed by, by, a, by measurements of, of what's going on inside of you. And so, so that's, that to me is the, the irony of all of this, especially for people who, who really want to leverage alcohol as a relaxing type activity is like, you're kind of just setting yourself up for more shit down the road. <laughs> and, um, I think it's Matt Mullenweg was quoted that alcohol or drinking borrows happiness from the future. So that's all that's really happening. You're just taking happiness and pulling it from the future into the present. But then when you get to the, 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 the future, you're at a deficit.
Hello. Hey, welcome back. Welcome back. I rebooted my computer just in case that would assist. I think we just, uh, it looks like we're still recording too. So this could be all part of the experience. <laughs> you got me just oh. like staring at a screen kind of. Well, we'll, we'll edit that part out. <laughs> I, I think spiritually speaking, we just had far too much truth being expressed. That's uh, my <laughs> honest belief. I've had this happen before on podcast interviews that we start talking about the real truth and it just can't handle it. All right. Well, I don't know where we want to pick back up. Let's just pick up. We were talking about how you were substituting alcohol for your connection to spirit. Right. So I think the biggest realization is kind of continuing the analogy around this container is when I removed the alcohol and the habits and the rituals and the time and all of these things, I found that there was like this huge vacancy, but in a good way to where it was almost unnerving where I was, it was like, okay, well, it's Saturday morning and I'm up at six and I feel oh my God. what do I do? <laughs> um, and, and actually in, the, in my book, Sober Entrepreneur, I, I create this very unscientific chart of kind of like the level of drinking commitment and how much time actually goes into it between the various, you know, the, oh. the pre, the, the planning, the actual time, the after time. And when it adds up, even, I mean, if you're doing it even once or twice a week, we're talking about like, like weeks of time over a year's period that is mm -hmm. going to this thing. And, and it's and crazy. That include, <laughs> does that include the energy drain you get from when you're kind of hung over or just, you know, to, to some extent, but you know, as we get older, like that, that, that fog of post drinking, like gets longer, you can't recover as fast. And, mm -hmm. you know, two drinks, you're like, I only had two glasses of wine last night and I feel so wrecked today. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that just is obviously a, an addition to that. So, but back to the spiritual side of things, when that was removed, I could then hear things I'd never heard before, which 100% is intuition. It's the voice. Like, it's just what, like what to share with us, what kind of things you hear. Well, I mean, the first was that I had a terrible business and I needed to end my partnership. <laughs> this was the partnership where you think between the two of you, you lost $200,000. Do you right? Know? Yeah. So I, I, uh, my last day of drinking, my day of retirement was October 22nd, 2013. And Really, it took about eight, nine months to, 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 to start to listen mm -hmm. to this voice. But in August mm -hmm. of 2014, I was at a conference in Indianapolis and it was supposed to be a fun conference. It was actually like a vacation that I was taking for this cool game conference I go to. And, mm -hmm. um, and I was having this miserable time and I was just like, this sucks. And so I Skyped mm -hmm. my partner in Buenos Aires and I was just like, I'm out. And the funny mm. part is, is he wasn't surprised. Like he knew too, mm. uh, but mm. I was kind of at the end recept. I was like the, the carrying all the weight of this. And I finally <laughs> broke and he was like, yeah, you're right. We should probably end it. And I was like, oh, motherfucker, oh. we should have done this a long time ago. <laughs> right. Would have saved a lot of heart break and lost energy, lost money. Yeah, exactly. And lo lots of bar bills that you paid while you were drinking to avoid the pain. Exactly. So that was like the first big decision. And then I was on like a rampage the rest of 2014 in the pursuit of the truth and pursuit of the, the mm. answers that I just never, and the questions, asking the questions that I never really asked before. Wow. Um, and so that's when I got dabbled in coaching and hired some coaches and really mm -hmm. loved that experience in the sense that I was mm -hmm. able to accelerate the questioning and answer process with a, per, a person to help me support not to what, give what would you i i was speaking to someone in the entrepreneur community we're both in and um he was saying that he just didn't see the you know coaches cost a lot is basically his reaction you know yeah well what i mean would you say to that i say what are you worth because if you don't have a high sense of value of yourself and what you're capable of, 
then you probably don't see the value in investing in yourself and -hmm. investing in support. But the Mm -hmm. coach is no different than a coach in any other vertical. The most, the best people in the world don't do it by themselves. They have numerous coaches supporting them because all coaching does is it allows you to gain perspective and evolve at a faster pace than the person who's not being coached. Mm. And, and that's, that's all what I tell people all the time. I, I agree with this guy. I was like, dude, coaching is insane. You pay all this money and then someone literally just asks you questions that you answer yourself and you do all the work, you do everything and you're paying them like three times the rate of a therapist or more, Mm -hmm. you know, depending on who it is, but it's that personal accountability. And it's also that unbiased mirror that someone can hold up right in front of you to Mm -hmm. say, look, Russ, you say you want this, but your actions are completely the opposite. What are you going to do? Are you going to reconcile that? Or are you going to be a hypocrite? And Mm -hmm. And I, and I, and I've outgrown several coaches and ultimately the program that I'm involved now, I don't work with a single coach. I just like the personal accountability of the, of the, of the network and the, the depth of the conversations that I have in my mastermind with a, that group. Um, mm-hmm. but, but to you, to the person you're talking to, I just think they, they don't value themselves. Mm. It could be, that's a good, good thing. How do you know you've outgrown a coach? I look at it at a real practical level because to me, business is like the, it's, it's what's real in this world. It's probably the easiest thing to measure by many, many dimensions. And so I have that as kind of my guiding guidepost of where I'm at in life. And for me, outgrowing my coach just meant I surpassed them in terms of my business creation. Cause I, I, it's hard for me to get spiritual advice or, leadership advice from someone who is hasn't been down the path that i'm i'm going down mm. it'd be no different for me to get like coaching advice from a um you know a 22 year old who's single with no kids it's like mm. i think i got a bit of a different game that i'm playing than you do not to say they're not intelligent or don't have some good insights but i want mm. i more or less look at as a coach as like a trail guide ahead of me Mm. looking back and saying, Hey, watch out there. Oh, be careful here. Be careful here. So once I mm-hmm. pass that trail guide, I need to find somebody else that to follow mm-hmm. and to, to learn from. Mm. So when you listen to your inner voice, how do you personally hear your, your inner voice? Do you actually literally hear voices in your head? Do you get a knowing Is there some other way your intuition comes to you? There, there's two, yeah, there's two very clear times. I think the first is during my prayer and meditation time. Uh, I do both separately. Prayer is more me having a conversation with God. I, I adopt the Christian belief system and that's mm-hmm. my, the way I understand the universe. Uh, meditation is me by myself with my own thoughts and not trying to connect to anything beyond myself. Mm-hmm. And so meditation is actually when I have, I know it's like kind of not what you're supposed to do when you meditate, like think about things, but that's <laughs> like when, when, when those. Who says uh, that? <laughs> well, like, Are there rules for meditation? And, like and, doing and, it wrong? And Andy from Headspace. Well, you know, it's not like that you don't have thoughts. It's just that you're supposed to sort of, you know, you're not supposed to hang on to them and you're supposed to let them flow through you. Um, uh. But that when those things come through me, that's when I have those aha moments but mm. then the second half of that is actually connect, keeping that thought and, and taking action. So mm. like for me, the intuition, when you, someone has a good intuition, that means they're good at doing things, not good at you know, meditating all day and having great insights. Like the intuition is only intuition when you actually act on it and it becomes real. Otherwise it's just Mm -hmm. dreaming or brainstorming. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. Mm. No, I think that's a good point. And, and I think the more we act on our intuition, the easier we, we hear those messages from our intuition. Yeah. And let me give you a great example. Um, I really love 
physical training from the stress and the peace that it gives me. And I've been really into running and outdoors and endurance. Actually, when we were in Thailand, I was a little nervous to just go outside and running with the traffic. And so I ran on the <laughs> treadmill and I was sweating so much on the treadmill that I was getting slippery because there was so much humidity in the air and it was just pouring. And it was like the treadmill was getting dangerous. But this, this, this uh, training I've been doing led up to this event called the, the World's Toughest Mudder, which was hosted two weekends ago. I have mm. been training for this for four months. I did it in 2016. It's a, it's a major endurance event, a 24-hour event. The night I was supposed to go, the, my intuition, I call it the voice, was saying, don't go. You've oh. been gone. You have been traveling. Your family needs you here. There's no reason for you to do this. And I, and I um, messaged my, my teammate, who's kind of the captain of the team. He lives close to me. He swung by the office. I was just, hey, man, I, I, like, we were leaving like in two hours. We were driving to Las Vegas to go to this race. It's like, I, I can't go. Like, like, I am listening to this. So sometimes it's hard because it's going to tell you the complete opposite. And I am not mm. joking. I'm like, I had my gear. I was packed. I was ready to go there. I was trained right. physically. I would have been fine. Mm -hmm. I've done mm -hmm. it before. I had the experience, but I listened to that. So it's that moment of action and quick mm. action that then mm -hmm. allows us to, to trust the voice more and trust our intuition and then, and then move more rapidly. Yeah. Well, so did you, you had a good experience from that particular one where you listened to that and didn't? didn't go for the run did it yeah no like the very next morning when i was we were supposed to leave on a thursday night the next morning um it was a holiday day for school so my daughter who my oldest daughter who's 12 junior junior high tough time to be a kid mm -hmm. when you're 12 and adolescence and all of that we went to breakfast that morning together i took her to the office with me and she just randomly started talking and opening up about some friendship challenges she's having. She was just connecting with me. And, and mm. you know, whatever she was talking about was very temporal and it was just in her world right then. But I, I, I put myself in the observer role and I was like, I would have never had this moment with my mm. daughter, which, which as you mm. know, connecting with you know, 12, like teenagers <laughs> or kids is not easy. Um, yeah. so I'm built, I was building that trust and connection with her and mm. that, like that breakfast alone and that eight minutes of that conversation, that alone was worth not going. But I had mm. a moment like that with each one of my family members throughout the entire weekend. And mm. that's, and that's what my intuition knew. It knew that this was a, I, this was not a time to go out and beat myself up in the desert for a few days. This was a time to mm -hmm. come back and connect with my family. Right. Do you think your younger self would have heard that message even if he hadn't been drinking? No, because drinking isn't the solution in its entirety. I think experience and mistakes allow me to, you just unfortunately get, get better with age. You know, you just make mistakes and you learn. Um, I probably would have gotten to this gotten to this point faster without drinking just because I, mm -hmm. I, I could have probably gone through more reps of life and moved quicker <laughs> through, through mm -hmm. stuff versus sort of mm -hmm. the slow pace. But, uh, but I think there's a combination there for sure. Mm. I mean, I, I almost wonder in myself whether I had to unlearn not listening to the, my inner voice. You know, I went through so much school and training and early jobs where we were told to be logical and yeah. and it's almost like I had to unlearn that stuff in order to be able to hear it more clearly. And yeah, I'm wondering if, if that's some of your experience or you had a different one. I tend to have been someone who's, who's, who's always sort of wanted to listen to my own intuition more so than others. Uh, it's mm -hmm. why I left my job at Apple. I used to work at Apple. I had the best job ever at Apple. And mm -hmm. I was a, one of the guys who worked in the retail store. I was a creative. I was like helping people every day. I got free Apple products. And, you know, to me, this is like, 
the cush life. I had benefits and stock options, um, but my voice said, hey, go down this new path of, of, mm. of entrepreneurship. You need to follow this. So I think I've always, mm. I think what I had to unlearn was this belief that there's some like t- tome, tome of knowledge that exists on a shelf somewhere where that if mm. I just find that, then I'll have enlightenment <laughs> and the answers. Mm. And it's like, and that was, and that's why I joined all these professional organizations and you know, it's why even we, we met, you know, virtually mm. the online forum is because I joined the Dynamite Circle because I was seeking answers mm. versus just like getting out there and doing shit and then learning and trying new stuff and, and you know, creating my I, own answers. I, I thought you joined the Dynamite Circle in order to have more drinking opportunities. <laughs> I was sober then when I joined. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I, sure. I, had I still been drinking as I learned in Thailand, there was the ample opportunity for uh, for socializing with a few cocktails. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just kind of thinking to our children, you know, because I think young children really are in touch with it, their inner voice. You know, when they're less than three years old, they, they, I mean, often they have imaginary friends. I mean, we we call them imaginary friends. Maybe they actually are hearing some voices that are giving them, you know, useful guidance. Yeah. Well, that, that is probably one of the things I think about the most as a parent, because I have two, uh, three daughters, 12, five, and two. Mm. Um, and I was a product of the school system, public school system in Arizona. I loved it. I was involved. I went to a uh, public university, Arizona state university, didn't help with the drinking to go there. That was a very big part of it. <laughs> party school. Um, but I look at my, my daughters now, even my 12 year old in the, in the seven years she's been attending school, it's changed drastically to where Mm. I, I really am thinking a lot about, are we deprogramming our children to not listen to themselves thinking Mm -hmm. that the answers are, uh, in rote or memorization. Mm -hmm. And it's tough. Cause like, like, you go back 2000 years and, and you look at the, the classical form of education in Roman and Greek empires and you, they did a pretty amazing job and they like studied and learned math and literature and like they were very engaged in like really fundamental things. So I think there's value there, but at the same time, what, what, how am I making sure they don't become you know, brainwashed of this promise of higher education that all of a sudden you're mm-hmm. going to emerge from grad school with your MBA in like the golden path of, of, of work. Like I have two people that work for me that have graduate degrees that are doing nothing at all, at all. Like it's just a huge student loan debt that they have. Mm-hmm. And it's only getting worse as, 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 you know, private or, or public education gets reconfigured. So I think about that all the time. And I think that's kind of our job as a parent is to make sure that we're inspiring and instilling imagination and questions and exploration. And, and ultimately it's one reason why I, I value travel so much for my family. I can't mm. do it like you have, or I've, I'm choosing not, I could do it. It would just require a lot um, of, of, of decisions to get into place. But for us, the summers are the summers of adventure and experiencing new cultures. And then, mm. and that's, that's like my mission for my kids until, until I die, you know, I will, I'll provide that for them as much as I can. I, I think experiencing new cultures is probably worth quite a few years of education. Um, right. just because it opens you up. To... And, I, and I remember my first, you know, my, my, my main cultural experiences are uh, growing up younger was living in Tucson, Arizona. There is a very huge um, Latin American, Mexican American communities. And I had tons of friends who were first generation from Mexico and we'd go to Mexico. So that was kind of one cultural that I was fortunate enough to have. And then, and, but then my next one really wasn't until I was in college and it was Mm -hmm. when I was 19 and I went to the British, British Isles. And that was like impactful. I mean, that's impacted me for, for decades. So I can only Mm -hmm. imagine what, what, 
we can do if we give those experiences at a young, younger age. Right. Um, I know we had a time constraint. Do, should we wrap up or should we continue? I, I just want to um, check in I think with we you. Could keep, let me just double check. Yeah, we could keep going. I got about another half okay. an hour. So my next okay. Time. I just want to respect, you know. Yeah. Our, yeah. No, I know we had some hang up. So let's keep going. Yeah. So I, here's my, I have a little bit of a difficult question for you. Is, mm -hmm. is it okay to pop it on you? Oh yeah. Shoot. It, if you asked your future daughter's self you know she's now 12 but let's move forward some period of years so she's a young adult what would her young adult self say to you you know should she stay in this school system should she do something else should she start <laughs> her own business you know should she travel i am going to be insanely biased in this say i think the true path of freedom is her creating her own business and if that mm. opportunity comes before a higher education experience, then I'm going to support her. However, success in business comes from experience. And so I, I definitely know that my successes have come from a decade of other experiences. They didn't just manifest when I was 19 at Arizona State University. If she gets that lucky, and that's those are the, the tech crunch articles that we see where it's like 18 year old builds Facebook app and sells it to, you know, for a hundred million dollars. Like those are the lottery, the entrepreneurial lottery winners. Uh, but everyone else, there is a growth period. So I'm going to be supportive. And, and, but I firmly believe that I, I don't want their future in someone else's hands. And I want to mm. raise them to be independent, confident women that could create on their own, their own paths. And, um, and so, you know, it's hard to imagine what the world will be like in 10 years, but that to me is my like guiding principle that won't change despite, you know, if like blockchain takes over the world, like, well, go into blockchain or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> mm. I mean, it, it is, you mentioned in, you know, independent, confident women. That's, you know, if you look at the traditional cultural labels we put on women, that's almost an oxymoron. You're not allowed to be independent and confident and a woman. I think yes. role, roles have really gotten fucked up over the years in, in both directions. There's, I think in any relationship, there are roles and whether they're gender assigned or not, I don't, I don't, it's, it's just like practically if I have a business and I have everyone without knowing where they fit into the equation, then that's a nightmare of an organization. I think the same goes in a relationship. Like there are mm -hmm. roles I don't think those roles have to be gender defined, but those roles have to be roles. But the main thing for me, um, you know, my mom, I was raised by a, like all women. My mom's, my mom's a feminist. She came, she's gay. She came out of the closet when I was like 15. So mm. I'm like Good for her. power. Yeah. Funny story about that. I can tell you if we have time. Um, but for my daughters, like, like I don't, whatever they end up from like the gender piece, that's their own personal decision. But I want them to be confident and have, and have an identity of who they are. Mm -hmm. And if, and if that is a, you know, traditional heterosexual relationship, great. Like that's not to me, it's not, that's not what I care about. It's just that they, they know where they stand and they have confidence and they don't have to go mm -hmm. through what my mom went through, which was being raised in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. 90s, 2000s, where, <laughs> where you have no identity because something inside you is saying one thing, but then culturally and everything's elsewhere and you're confused. And so I, I'd want to eliminate that. And I think in business, their success is going to be dictated by them from an early age, learning about intuition, learning about trusting themselves and not seeking that in someone else to fulfill them or complete them. Mm, that's interesting. So the being not addicted to a substance, being addicted to having a relationship or addicted to. Correct. And that was my big mistake. And I look back and it's easy to sort of play the what if games, but, you know, being raised in a single mom household, I think mm. what 
what did this have to do or how did this influence then my, my deficits that I had growing up? And did I, was that influential? And then like me feeling like I needed to seek out affirmation and answers from others. You know, Mm -hmm. if I had a, a father figure that was more active in my life, could that have solved that? Now, those games are stupid because, you know, like we, we wouldn't be talking today had that been the case. Mm-hmm. But in the same mm-hmm. sense, like for me, my daughter I had when I was a senior in high school or not high school, college, it was, a, mm-hmm. it, was an, it was an accident, surprise, my oldest. And, um, mm-hmm. but like from day one, I was like, okay, my new role as a dad, my new role is to make sure she has support in all areas and, mm-hmm. um, and not grow up in a, this like not grow up with a deficit as much as I can handle, you know, as a parent, you're going to fuck everyone up eventually, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, like the biggest thing that I see for them now is get them, let them know that an external relationship should be an additive engagement, mm-hmm. not a just get me to full engagement. Mm-hmm. Like it should be, it should be, overfilling your cup with something that's greater than you could have by yourself. But when you're by yourself, you should have independence and confidence and not feel like you need that, whether that's personally, professionally, spiritually, wherever it might be. Mm. That sounds like a great thing to do for, for daughters or sons. Um, Yeah. Any child. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of wondering, I mean, I, I notice that, me and you and a lot of humans have a lot of addictions, you know, whether it's drugs or relationships or money or shopping or food, you know, cell phones. I noticed a lot of people now are addicted to their cell phone. Yeah. Um, why, why are people so addictive? You know, is it, (sighs) that's a big question. I mean, in my book, I really think a lot of it has to do with how we, the tools that we've been given to manage a really crazy life, like to this world is Mm -hmm. nuts compared to the past Mm -hmm. generations. And we -hmm. don't teach mindfulness in school. We don't teach the power of. What would it take? What would it take that we taught mindfulness to our children? I, I think that's an independent decision that we have to do it with as a parent. You know, I don't, Mm -hmm. and that this is like this, the shifting of responsibility that we believe that we believe that not, not you and I, I don't, I don't think, but that the general Mm -hmm. population, you know, when things are going well, things are going well and great. But when things go bad, everyone believes it's like someone else's problem or it's not my fault. Um, And the, the habits in which, that have been around for thousands of years are being ignored and we're raising people and even people my age, I'm 34, who don't even understand that food from a box in a plastic bag in a mach- made by a machine, that's not actually food. That's like a chemical product that's digestible. So can you eat it? Sure. Are some probably worse chemicals or better chemicals? Like, absolutely. But that basic 101 is like vacant in so many conversations. And we get, I think in the circles we run in, we like, it's kind of comfy because everyone's like, oh yeah, meditation. I meditate. I'm in Chiang Mai. I'm at a temple meditating. Like, <laughs> like come on. I know meditation. But I talked to my team here and I'm like, guys, we're going to meditate at our, at our um, business event, like our workshop, and we're going to meditate. It's, whoa, like crazy. And uh, mm-hmm. so I just think from your question, like why is addiction so rampant? It's because people don't have the tools to, 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 to manage stress and problems and things that just are a part of life. Imagine the agrarian farmer in, you know, the 1800s, like him and his wife in an argument, but that he has to like go to bed at seven and wake up, um, at, you know, at three 30 in the morning and go till the fields for four hours. Like that argument is so 
gone. By the time he gets back, he's just <laughs> able to have a meal there for them. And so, like, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of things that I think have helped us manage stress and problems. Um, and not to mention the, the cell phones. I don't, I think my cell phone's in my car, but like, I don't even know where my cell phone is. Like that device is like electrons of, of stress and distractions and all of the things all the time. So no wonder we are like, ah, fuck it. I want a drink. Like I can't handle it. <laughs> Maybe we should treat our cell phones like guns. They should be locked in the car and they're a tool to be used when handy, but not carried, concealed it's, on our body I, all the time. I love it. Do you uh, know the author and really great blogger, Cal Newport? I, I don't. But oh, you have to check him out. You will love him. So he's actually a computer, like a theoretical computer scientist at MIT and blogs and writes and published a book about the dangers of distraction and how we're kind of mm. ruining ourselves. And cell phone addiction is going to be the cigarettes of the next generation. Where right now everyone's like, you know, like you look at the, the, the fact that like our, our parents are like, we smoked at dinner, we smoked in airplanes, like it was no problem. Mm -hmm. Like smoking's fine, I can smoke if I want to, but it's this major public health risk. So fast forward 10, 20 years, once that happens, he's like, this is going to be a major public health risk between depression and stress and all sorts of things. I, I seem to remember, I, I don't know if this was cinemas or airplanes, but I'm sure it was like, if you want to smoke, you go on the right side of the plane or the cinema. And if you don't want to, you go on the left. Maybe we can do that. <laughs> you know, it was a, an intermediary step, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. I get so triggered by cell phones. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure coming technology where they're just going to implant it, the cell phone technology directly in your brain, you know, it'll... Uh... And then that's, that's the point where I become old man Russ, where I'm like, I am not going to put that contact lens computer in my eye. Like, computers are for devices that you can put away. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... How do we stay in touch with our inner voice if we are 24 seven hooked up to the internet or whatever its successor is? Just make time to not be plugged into anything else other than yourself. Yeah. I mean, that was going to be a challenge as we, you know, as, as humans, we evolve in with the technology. We do. And and, all the, you know. and, and who knows, like there may be some breakthrough of, you know, transdental eye, rapid eye movement technology that allows us to immediately access the voice with the ad, with the assistance of technology. Uh, but mm. until then, to me, the biggest insights I've ever had have been when I'm on a trail or, you know, mm. like writing in a journal or just, just by myself. So as long as that, that keeps outperforming, the technology engagements, I'll continue to go back to that. Mm. But to be in those states, you have to be comfortable with yourself. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately why I think a lot of people avoid meditation, working out, exercise, sobriety, is because when you're in that state, you are forced to really know and examine yourself. And people aren't comfortable with that. They've made bad decisions. There's guilt. Mm. And, uh, I mean, it's, I could easily talk about my affair because I don't have any guilt about it. I have no secrets. Mm. My wife, mm. she encouraged me to write the book. Mm. So, but if, if you're not at that state of honesty with yourself, there, there no doubt you want to hide away and not, and not, and, and avoid that. Maybe that's one of the greatest gifts we can give our children and our staff to be comfortable with themselves to the point where they can be on their own for five minutes. Correct. And actually, we've implemented a weekly leadership call. It's not with the whole team. It's with about eight people where we, and I, you know, it's not forced, but I try to set a good precedence. We share really personal stuff and mm -hmm. we share it on a, it's, we called it fucked up and fired up. So what's like the fire <laughs> thing you're fired up about of the last week? And what's the thing you're fucked up about? But a great example is one, one, one of my team members, uh, her husband, her not her husband her brother who's an older brother in his 50s got put into jail for drug possession and drug abuse uh mm. this week, like thanksgiving week and so 
his wow. son is at her house and she was really upset. And we didn't try to solve her problems. We didn't try to fix her or give her tips or coach her. We just, it's just a format where she can be honest and open. And that was it. And she mm. later on was like, I was so looking forward to this call to mm. be able to share this and get it off my chest. Mm. And that to me was like, that's the next level of leadership inside our families and inside our businesses is creating a place where people can actually talk about personal stuff and not have judgments, not have, Oh, it's HR. We shouldn't like blah, blah, blah. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. We're human beings. So we right. need connection. Absolutely. I mean, I sometimes think I'm not so much an entrepreneur occasionally having spiritual experiences. I'm a spiritual being having an entrepreneurial experience. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, of course. I, and, I think the latter is way more accurate. Yeah. And, and in addition, my business is actually a vehicle for my spiritual growth to be far more accelerated than if I just stayed in the, the regular job that I had before I started my business. Right. Because we are physical beings in a spiritual world right now. And whatever you believe is beyond this current existence, this current existence is really reliant on money and things and stuff. And so if I want to have an experience in Thailand or I want to have an experience scuba diving or just an experience where I don't have to do anything for two weeks because I'm at a silent retreat, that requires money and sports. And that's what the business fuels. Fuels it mm -hmm. for me, fuels it for my family. Mm -hmm. Seems like you have the same philosophy around that. And for your staff too. And for my staff, exactly. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So just as we wrap this interview up, why are you proud to use your business intuition to listen to this inner voice? My biggest pride comes literally from seeing the way we're helping thousands of people every single day. And that, mm. that engine of value would have never existed had I not listened to my voice to pursue this idea. And mm. I believe that the idea was, was given to me by the voice and my intuition because I was now ready to create this. And it said, you know what? Now I can trust you with this idea and you can now help these people because you, you now are the person who can handle it and you're not going to mm. crumble under pressure of, and, you know, resort to destructive habits. So I'm just proud that I'm there. Um, I'm proud that I've written a book documenting a lot of this because even if I don't give it to anybody, that's going to be a, um, a memoir for my children, which I never had mm -hmm. from my parents. They're mm. both, they're both still alive, but they don't, you know, what I know about their past is anecdotal and there's never mm -hmm. really like lessons. So um, that mm -hmm. also was part of my intuition was writing this book and sharing this, this, this journey that I've been on. Wow. Do you, do you feel in some sense the book wrote, you, you, you know, the book brought you to writing it rather than you wrote the book, you know, I'm not phrasing that quite right, but the book <laughs> wrote you instead of you wrote the book. I think the book was there all along. I just had to compile it. You know, there was nothing to write cause it was there. Like the story was there. And so you kind of, you got into the zone and the words just came out kind of thing. Yeah, I did end up hiring uh, uh, Laura Hanley, who you may know. She she, uh, does, she helped me on my book. Yeah, so she's a gem and just got me through. I got to about 28,000 words and was like, like, so there was literally help with the writing too. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> but she, she, her value was, was knowing the right way to get the deeper story, which that was the mm -hmm. gift that she brought to the table and our collaboration mm -hmm. was, I, I just am so thankful for her support and coach. I mean, talk about coaching. She was literally like a, like a psychologist for me, like, come on, Russ, mm -hmm. we can do this. Uh, but the book itself, um, I knew that was, I was like on a mission to get this done for my own historical sort of gift to my If I change one life and prevent them from hitting rock bottom, then that is a, 
a huge mm-hmm. win for me. Not about being an author. It's mm-hmm. about changing a life. Right. Well, we'll put a link to the, to the book in the show notes. Uh, it's The Sober Entrepreneur. Is there a subtitle or? Change your family tree. Oh, <laughs> okay. So we've talked about the importance and how much value you've got from connecting to your business intuition. What would it take to make business intuition openly used by every entrepreneur this year? Know thyself. I mean, mm. if, you, if you know yourself, your intuition, if you know yourself, your intuition will manifest naturally. You don't have to find it or search for it because mm. all of a sudden you do a small thing like I'm going to pick this restaurant instead of this one and that restaurant was really great. And you're like, oh, that worked. And they do a little bit of bigger thing, like I'm going to, you know, whatever, make this phone call. I feel like I should reach out to this person. And that ends up providing more of like, oh, wow, that really worked. And you gain this confidence listening to the voice and growing and growing and growing. Mm. But you can't ever take that first step if you are hiding from yourself. Mm. Great advice there. So if people want to find you online, uh, what are the best ways to do that? So I am on a competition to beat my wife and Instagram followers. So if I could ask anybody <laughs> and everybody to follow me on Instagram, it's just instagram.com slash Russ Perry. And then if you're interested in my story in the book, you can get signed up, get a first chapter free at soberentrepreneur.com. Fabulous. Well, we'll help you beat your wife. That sounds like a really uh, spiritual goal. That, that, is, that is like tied into the universe right there. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully you share useful things on your Instagram to I do. do with your journey. I, so. I do. I do. Yeah. I do a lot of, um, you know, anecdotal kind of quips and inspiration and lifestyle stuff, just kind of what I'm going through and where I'm at. So Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. Hey, thank you very much. This was an awesome uh, experience. Actually, a lot of my story I've never really shared before. So um, I'm excited to get the copy of this and, and distribute it in our circles as well. Absolutely.